Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Mike Donnelly, proprietor of Luck Knives. I followed Mike when he was reviewing knives on YouTube as NAF Sergeant. In fact, he inspired the purchase of one of my favorite folders to date. But what's more exciting than getting his take on other people's knives is seeing his own vision and skill develop as a knife maker. I have yet to check out any of his fixed blade knives in person, maybe, hopefully at Blade Show, Uh, but I'd like to think I have a good eye. And from what I've seen of his work, he's off to a very auspicious start. His luck knives thus far sport a refined yet utilitarian look, and his craftsmanship seems to be beyond what you'd expect from a new maker. I'm excited to find out how he got started and where he plans to take luck knives. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this show. You can also download it to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do that by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and checking out what we have to offer there. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Hello, Mike. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Bob. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. We've we've had a lot of uh, uh, glancing conversations on Thursday Night Knives. Sometimes you'll tune in and I'll see your logo pop up and it's like, it's always exciting to have a knife maker or someone you know from YouTube popping in. So I feel like in a way I know you already just from watching your videos. Anyway, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, I want to congratulate you first and foremost. Uh, on this transition you've made to knife making. Um, I know you uh, for, for longer as an AF sergeant, you know, reviewing knives. Um, how did how did this take place? How did you go from NAF sergeant to luck knives? Um, so as you know, I was doing knife reviewing on YouTube for a little while and um when I when I do something, usually it tends to I get tunnel vision, and um, a lot of time other things kind of get overlooked, I guess. So I get really laser focused on doing YouTube videos, and um, you know stuff happened in my life where I just wasn't really able to. Um, I wasn't able to put out the level of quality of content that I was really wanting to, but. Um, I've always, even before that, I've always enjoyed making things. And in my channel, I did a little video series where I wanted to make my first ever knife. And then, um, that one didn't turn out so great. I mean, it is still a functional tool, but it is definitely not really that awesome. And after I did that, I made another knife and then I made another, another knife. And I kind of started realizing that as something that I really enjoyed doing. So that is why I kind of decided to, put the channel on hold. I, I put out a video every now and then, nothing really all that crazy, but um, I've really started to focus more on making knives and I've started purchasing more and more equipment. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. So it's did something you, I'm really enjoying doing. <laughs> did you have to sell off a bunch of your knife collection uh, to get equipment? I, I know a lot of people end up doing that. Oh yeah. I sold off uh, one of my grail knives and oh. Just that knife alone, I was able to buy a 2x72 grinder and um, a couple other things. Nothing like I got like a bandsaw and, you know, a few of the essentials for knife making, really. So A Cadillac. Uh, <laughs> what what was the grail knife? You got to tell me. Uh, it was a Frank Fisher Fury, which now lives on in Dirk Werning's collection. So. How did um yeah <laughs> he shows it off say, all the time but how how did i know how did i know that's where it ended up <laughs> so he always told me that if i was going to sell it to go to him first because he really wanted it so uh but yeah i mean it's, i haven't regretted it yet so and i'm still enjoying this still learning definitely so well that that um, first that first knife uh that you are, are calling um not great 
actually looked really cool. You used a really, if I'm thinking of the same knife, uh, you used a really interesting sort of damascene steel, and it was sort of uh, scalpeling right here, probably the. Oh yes. Yep. Uh, it is. Uh, Baker Forge, uh, Damascus, which honestly, if you're going to make your first knife doing fancy Damascus is probably not the route you want to go. You want to use, um, material that is easy to, easy to heat treat and all that stuff. But honestly, the core of this blade is actually just ADCRV2. And that's what they say is to just heat treat it the same way as ADCRV2, which is a relatively easy steel to heat treat. So. That's kind of one reason why I was willing to do it, but um, it's kind of where your finishing work really comes through when it comes to the, the Damascus. So um, and that was just kind of the material that I already had on hand because I bought that for a, uh, a future build to send off to a maker at some point. And, but I had it sitting around, so I figured why not? So that's kind of where I got my start from right there. And now I've went in, I have a whole pile of different knife making materials sitting behind me. So it's kind of a whole new sickness unto <laughs> knife collecting at this point. Okay. So both, now I'm both going to all the sites and looking at that stuff now. So, <laughs> Oh, going and lur lurking around the handle material section and yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into the knives first? I, I, I want to talk, I want to really dive into your, your, process and your designing and everything. Uh, but before we get there, I, I want to find out a little bit about your past with knives. It, uh, I'm, I'm presuming you served uh, in the United States Army. Is that, is that right? Uh, Air Force. I am still currently in right now, still active duty. Um, I'm, I'm on leave right now. I've been on leave for about like three weeks or so. That's why I kind of have the beard going on. Um, I've been at this point, I've been serving for just a little bit over 14 years. Wow. So I got six more years to go. And um, this summer, I'll be um, PCSing uh, to a new station up in Utah. So that'll probably be the last base that I'll be at before I retire. And we haven't really decided where we're going to live after that. But um, I'm originally from upstate New York. I lived there pretty much my entire life before uh the military uh very rural area i know it's kind of a weird thing to say because a lot of people just automatically think new york city um but a very rural area up there and so i mean just having a knife is kind of a normal thing that you have on the day-to-day -day. um i'm not like out there bushcrafting or anything just just what we all do just opening stuff or anything that needs to be cut really um so i mean i've always kind of had one in my pocket all the time and yeah and then I, I didn't really get anything like I, I wasn't really aware of like all the different levels of knife i just kind of had like a crappy little gerber knife i think it was when i was a younger person but um it wasn't until i got in the military and i went on my first deployment and i got issued a gerber 06 auto which <laughs> that one was actually pretty nice it actually had a really nice snappy action to it and it was really good and around the time that I started my channel, I bought another one and that, that one was not so good, but, um, yeah, it was at that point when I started kind of diving down the rabbit hole of looking into, cause you know, and it has giant letters like S 30 V and I'm like, I don't know what that is. And so I start Googling and next thing you know, you're just on YouTube. So that's kind of the, how it goes really. So you were issued a, an automatic in the air force. Yeah. Wow. Can, can I ask what you, what your job is in the air force? Um, I do currently, I am a F 35 avionics specialist. Oh um, God. basically any sort of radios, flight controls, navigation, wire maintenance, any sort of thing like that, really that breaks on the jet. I got to go out and fix it. So, and then before that, uh, I'm currently at Nellis Air Force Base here in Nevada. I've been here forever now, it feels like. Um, before that, when I first got here, I was on the A-10 doing the same job. And then um, that squadron got contracted out to civilian contractors. So we got forced cross-trained over to F-35s. And before that, um, I was working on the U-2, the spy plane. So, Oh, my 
God. Okay, so Mike, I, I did uh, in in a uh, earlier part of my life, I did a uh, a series called Firepower for Discovery Military, and my favorite stuff was always the airplanes because my father served in the Air Force. By the way, thanks for your service, especially fourteen years of it. My God, um, and he was at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, and mm -hmm. you know, I guess my dad, I, I got my love of airplanes from him. Um, just this very night, I saw four F 16s fly over when I was taking my daughter somewhere, which was very cool, uh, for me anyway. But, um, Nellis, I used to get a lot of footage from the, the from the test sites at Nellis, uh, to put in my show. And, um, the, the A10 Warthog is, you know, by far my favorite airplane, but I always thought it was cool that they were going to transition over to the F 35, um, which seems like kind of an opposite type airplane um, in, in terms of it just seems so space age and sophisticated. Um, I don't know. And then the U2, that's amazing too. Yeah. That's actually, the U2 is actually probably my favorite airplane to work on. So <laughs> um, wow. that, that was the plane that I also did all my deployments with. And I went to Korea for a year on the U2 as well. So a lot of traveling. It was fun. <laughs> wow. That is cool. Well, um, yeah, upstate New York, I went to college in upstate New York and yeah, there is a lot more to, uh, the state of New York than New York city, like a whole lot more. Yeah. So, th so that's, you were carrying knives because it was just a part of your lifestyle. Yeah. And then you got involved in the air force, got, got, uh, issued the one great Gerber, I guess. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and time, I guess. I don't know. It, it started from there. So how did you get into making YouTube videos? Uh, that started pretty much in the middle of COVID. Um, I don't know. I was just kind of out of boredom. I watched, I was watching a lot of metal complex and slicey dicey and all those guys at the time. And, um, I actually was because I, I originally bought the, the Hoback Sumo when it first came out mm -hmm. and there was no videos on YouTube on it at all. And I figured I'm going to try this thing out. So I, ma I made the first video on the Hoback Sumo on YouTube. And that kind of just went from there. And and then I sent that off to Metal Complex and he proceeded to blow it up. So um, and I was doing daily videos for probably about six months or so. And my channel was actually seeing tremendous growth. And but like I said, I got that tunnel vision. So stuff that was should have got a little bit more attention didn't get, didn't get quite as much attention. So I kind of reeled it back a little bit, pumped the brakes. And, um, so I kind of started not putting out quite as many videos, but I was really trying to increase the quality of those videos. Like I was doing music and B roll and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Um, but even then eventually that started to become almost kind of like a job, even though I'm, I wasn't even getting paid for it cause it's just a hobby for me. So Right. Um, yeah. And then, like I said, kind of, I, I decided to do the whole knife build project and that just, I took a lot more interest into that. So. <laughs> okay. So a lot of, uh, famous knife makers, um, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, the guy who I don't remember his name who started SOG, um, and Ernie Emerson and, and a number of others who, who are escaping me at, at the moment started in aerospace and in one, you know, in engineering or, uh, one aspect or another, how do you, how did your expertise in maintaining avionics in, in the most high tech airplanes, uh, that exist? How, how did that guide you when you started making knives? Um, honestly, that has nothing to do with my knife making, uh, because when it comes down to like doing CAD and all that stuff, I have no clue. I have no sort of engineering degree or anything like that. Um, so, but growing up with my dad, my dad does own a, like a contracting company. So all the way up from when I was like a little kid up until before I left for the military, I've been pretty much building houses with him. Yeah. So I and I'd like work on all my own cars and stuff. So I do have, I am pretty mechanically inclined. So, um, when it comes down to like making things and all that sort of stuff, I do take to it pretty quickly. So, and when it comes on to actually knife making, I watch a lot of YouTube, like whenever you 
trying to figure out how to do anything. YouTube is always a great resource, really. So, um, yeah, a lot of Walter Sorrels and I I'm still to this day, I'm still trying to figure out how to grind and just do everything better. Pretty much. It's all still a learning process for me. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So this most recent knife, uh, you posted a video on and, uh, the squall, um, uh, yeah. man, that is really, really beautiful. And, and I'm looking at it, uh, you know, just on screen on my phone or on my laptop and it looks really, um, you know, like I said up front, it looks very refined in the grinding to me. And, and I'm like, wait a second, this guy just started this. Is it? Am I am I being dazzled by the actual um, metal that the the actual steel he used, or am I looking at this right? Like, it looks so good, you know. Even with the uh, the sweat, you have a swedge running along the top. Um, yeah. That well, yeah. The I think you're talking about where to go? Oh yeah. It was here somewhere. Um. Oh my god. Well, this is awkward. <laughs> oh, oh, I sold this it. one right here. It's gone. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I built, I made this one for a uh, Instagram uh, knife building competition. You know, even though I am a um, definitely a beginner still, I figured what else, what do I have to lose really? I mean, might as well give it a shot. Um, so yeah, this is Baker Forge uh, Ice Storm Raindrop Damascus and it is a San Mai style seal, as you can see right here. This is also an ADC RV2 core. And I just love the way that San Mai Damascus looks. And it also has a really good functional factor to it because it has a performance steel as a core. And um, like I said, I've, I'm pretty much a custom knife collector at this point. And so even though I know a lot of people don't, I really do like the fancy materials. Yeah. I, I did watch Dr. Frankie's channel for a long time. So I do kind of like that stuff. And I decided to also make the scales also the same Damascus material. And then just to make it a little bit crazier, I have, you can't really see it that very well on the camera here, but there's uh turbo glow liners. So in the dark, those uh, glow blue. Um, and yeah, I've not done very many swedges on knives, but I definitely wanted to take my time and do this one right because I messed up a few. <laughs> so I've messed up quite a lot, actually, but um, definitely took my time on this one and I'm pretty happy with how it came out. It's also only the second knife where I did where I actually use a removable hardware. That was kind of a new thing mm -hmm. for me, too. So, um, yeah, I mean, what is the What is the challenge with using removable hardware? It was just figuring it all out and um, you kind of have to grind everything down to fit. You have to have it like size right and you got to have the right chamfering tools and all that kind of stuff. Because I'm kind of in the process of I don't have quite quite all the tools that I need, but I'm not trying to buy everything right now because like I said, we're moving to Utah. Mm. So I'm not trying to have a whole bunch of stuff to move. So but once we get to Utah, that is when um to get my little shop area fully kitted out at that point. So is to, I would, I would like to uh, more long-term goals. I would like to get a mill because um, right now it's kind of a pipe dream, but I really would like to start making folding knives at some point, but it is quite complex and I'm not quite sure how to do it yet, but um, I need that. I do still need to get a heat treating oven because all the knives that I have right now, I'm still heat treating using a forge that I made. Hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a very rudimentary one, um, but it's easy to take down. So when it move, when we move, I can easily just take it down and move it pretty easily. So, um, and I got to give a shout out to Super Steel Steve when he came on your podcast because. I had no idea that those those thermo crayons existed that like mm. they melt at a certain temperature. Those make heat treating like so easy. So um, I mean, it's not like a absolute. Like super accurate, but it definitely helps with a lot more accuracy than what I was doing where you just kind of check with the magnet. But right. um, so, yeah.
And I do have a couple Magna Cut knives, that, but I actually sent those off to Transparent Knives to have him heat treat them. <laughs> good, good move. <laughs> um, yeah. So until I get my own heat treating oven, that's kind of what I have to do with stainless steel. So, well, uh, a couple of things here. I, I think uh, first of all, uh, it's it's pretty audacious to start with such high end materials. I mean, even even though you had it laying around for some future custom build, uh, but in a way, did. Did starting off with uh, exotic steels, exotic meaning, you know, Baker Forge and and yeah. uh, did did that put your feet to the fire and really force you to be serious about it? Uh, yeah, a little bit, because um, those first few knives, when you use that kind of steel, you can definitely tell um, like once you finally put it in that final etch and you put the final finish on it you can definitely tell like you can see all the little scratches and stuff still that are still in the blade. So you definitely kind of find out that you, you definitely can't half ass it whenever you're doing your final finish work, like all your hand rubs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so, I mean, it was a good learning process, but yeah, I would definitely recommend if it's something you're wanting to consider doing to start making knives, you definitely want to use a more like, basic steel like like i said it was all i had around so that's kind of what i just went with so um i have a lot of regular ones now too like i have these ones right here these ones are like a regular um 52 100 steel which is actually mm -hmm. a steel that's been around for forever but um for what i have um my equipment down in my garage like this is a steel that as long as i follow the recipe for it i can pretty easily get it up to 62 63 hrc so um that's kind of what i was going for it is just meant to be a a small lightweight um just the edc you know something you can carry in your pocket this has a belt loop on the sheath mm. um i do have like pocket clips i can put on the sheath as well um but yeah it's just meant to be just a good everyday cutter and I just want it to be able to hold a good edge and um, I like to make colorful things, I guess. I don't, I'm not, I'm, I don't always go straight for the OD green or the black, despite right. being in the military. I've never, <laughs> I've never claimed to be a, I've made that very clear on my channel before. I've never claimed to be any sort of combat veteran or anything like that. Like I, I'd know nothing about knife fighting. So just so you know, <laughs> well, you probably see enough black and OD green in your day to day. Can you hold that oh, knife yeah, back up? Sure. That's, that's really I, nice. I wear it every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold that knife back up. Let's see it. And, and, uh, and l let us take a, a look at this. You so, just, yeah, this po is you just posted small... like 10 of these, right? Huh? You just you just made a, like a, a small batch of like ten of these or something, right? Ah, uh, yeah, like twelve or something like that. But yeah, this one is like Tiffany blue G10 mm. with matching Tiffany blue G10 pins, and this has a Tiffany blue Kydex sheath. And I made a few of those. I still have more material left, but then I also got uh, pretty much the same thing, but in ivory G10 and Ooh. white Kydex, kind of like a stormtrooper type look. Yeah. Um, I got a whole bunch of colors. Still got the Magna Cut one with the Starry Night Kydex here with layered oh. G10. I go crazy with materials. So, that is... and then I also even have uh, right here, we have a San Mai uh, steel. It is the same core as the 50, it is 52100 core. So, it's, you're basically going to get the same performance out of it, but it's the San Mai. And this has my personal favorite, uh, my Carta. It is, it's a little dark, but um, vintage emerald green paper, my Carta. I have mm. that. Like I have so many different materials. It's kind of ridiculous. Wait, hold that one back up. That is stunning with that, with that, my Carta and the, and the uh, San Mai. God, that's beautiful. <laughs> so I really like the profile of these. Uh, this, this is what I was talking about up front, like utilitarian, but elegant. You know, they look like, they kind of look like little Japanese chef's knives in a way. Uh, and yeah, I mean, th th like, here's like the one that it's my personal one right here. Wow. Um, this is the same vintage emerald green uh, paper micarta with titanium pins and uh, Alabama Damascus blade. Um, super thin. These are full hollow ground. That was intentional. I know a lot of people, they'll bring the grind higher up if they kind of mess it up and it's not quite even, but. <laughs> 
it was my intention from the start to actually do a full hollow grind because that was actually inspired by uh, this knife right here. Uh, Trevor Berger. This is an Atlas and all, I think all of his knives actually are full height hollow grind. And I love the way that these knives perform. Like these knives cut so awesome. So that's kind of what this was inspired by because I, I wanted to have this sort of cutting performance out of my knives. So yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of that full height hollow grind. And, and my introduction to that was through the Jack Wolf knives there. They all, except for one of them, um, the slip joints, they all have that full height hollow grind. It gets it real thin and it stays thin for quite a while, you know, quite for quite a distance up the blade. And, uh, yeah. man, uh, that's makes it really, uh, well, like you said, an effective cutter. Um, 52, 100, isn't that, that's the ball bearing steel. Yep. Yep. It's been around the based off the research I did. And that's another thing. I did a lot of uh, reading Laren Thomas's book too, the knife engineering mm. book. Just read that thing. I do all kinds of research. Uh, but yeah, that steel, I want to say has been around since like the twenties or something like that. Um, I know spider co's used it before um, on a sprint run. It, it Actually I saw, what was it? I forget which website, but there are some other, Oh, um, uh, what's his name? The guy that does the kukri the uh um jason jason knight. knight yeah yeah he just put out some knives on 52 100 as well i saw so yeah i mean it's still in use today so i mean it, it's a good easily heat treatable at least for what i have right now and it's probably for for the best because i'm not really like the, the super steels are way more expensive to buy like bulk mm. like large sheets of them so um, you def it's, it's good to start out on the cheaper stuff. So, um, well, you talked about Magna cut now, uh, what are the challenges that presents? Like, is it a fun um, steel to work, but difficult to heat treat or, um, well, because it's stainless, you really have to, it has to be in a very controlled environment when it's being heat treated. Um, you definitely want to use for any stainless steel, really, you definitely want to use a heat treating oven. And like, I, that's just not something I have, but I had a big bar of it again for a future custom build that I was going to send off, but I ended up not needing it. So I kind of made a bunch of blanks and I sent those off to Brian for him to heat treat him for me. And yeah, and I was able to make a few of them. Um, one of them I messed up and what I learned on that first one was um, it definitely overheats much faster than regular high carbon steel like you definitely got to be a lot more careful definitely keep it cold keep it wet as much as possible so oh um, this is while you're grinding it yeah. all right so so let's get into your process so you do the heat treat before you put the bevels uh tell me about your process let's take take it soup to nuts um so i grind out the profile um, well now I have a, it used to be a lot more work. There used to be a lot more sacrificial material because for a while I didn't have the bandsaw. So, um, that made everything so much better. <laughs> so, um, yeah, cut it out and then I'll typically grind your, I actually have a unground blank right here. So this is the same one as this one right here. And so what I do here is I'll get the profile and then there's no choil, no finger choil right here. I'm trying to get centered on the screen there. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, this line right here, this little vertical thing, I actually use that as the guide for my plunge grind. So I'll do like a rough grind first. I won't quite go up all the way to the, the spine. I'll get it like probably about 70, 80% of the way. And then I'll heat treat it. And then I will finish it off at that point. And then after I um finish it that's when i grind in the finger choil and yeah it's just real comfortable in the hand nice and small feels real, i mean i have medium sized hands so i don't know how quite yet how it'll be for somebody with larger hands but um it's just a nice neutral ergonomic handle really. so you were talking about keeping it keeping it cool and wet meaning you don't want to spoil the heat treat by overheating it while you're while you're finished grinding it or or yeah. continuing with that bevel yeah so because um 
more increasingly nowadays, people are quite, they're very critical on heat treat. So while, while I like to do all kinds of pretty materials, I do want to ensure that it is a, uh, a good functional blade. And I am, I am one of those people too, where, mm -hmm. um, I would like a steel to be at the HRC that it should be because ultimately that's when you're going to get like, what's, what's the point in having a fancy super steel if you're not getting it at its full potential, essentially, like you're getting what you're paying for, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's like, uh, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of um, talk about that recently, just about um, larger batch makers um, not maybe taking MagnaCut especially up to its uh, full potential. And and the question is why, you know, um, do you stand to, the closer you get to heat treating it exactly the way it should be, do you come closer to ruining it? I mean, that's my question. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I am not a heat treat expert by any stretch of the imagination. I don't claim to be either. I'm just trying to follow the protocol on yeah. like what I'm reading on, whether it be knife steel nerds or whatever, because I would like to get as much performance out of it as possible too. Um, I know Brian, he heat treated all the magna cut to 64 HRC. So um, it's, it's pretty much up to me at that point to not ruin that heat treat. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but yeah, I think it's kind of just comes down to a lot of companies. They don't want to make the steel too brittle because I know it's a, a new steel. It's probably not a steel that a lot of them have really worked with really that much. So I guess they're just trying to play it safe, but, um, based off what Laren Thomas says, I mean, he isn't the all knowing person of everything, but he did design the steel. So <laughs> yeah. that, that is his baby. So, I mean, right. That, that does give him uh, yeah, a, a leg up on knowing, I mean, and he is pretty brilliant. He probably is the guy, the guy uh, for, for all blade steels, just because he's put so much thought and he's got his PhD in it. So, um, I mean, talk about talk about a dude who knows his steel, you know, he creates new steels for the car industry, you know, for work, all this other stuff is in his spare time. It makes me think, uh, when, when a company doesn't, doesn't really, uh, heat treat magna cut all the way up to 64 or whatever it's, uh, upper threshold is that it's more about selling a knife with magna cut. You know, it's kind of like getting the shirt with the, with the label on it, you know, uh, with the polo pony on it or something to sell yeah. the shirt. Um, and that feels a little, a little weird. You would, you would rather know that someone, um, you know, like transparent knives, uh, he, he right. seems to be, uh, the one who's He's really hard on all knives. So <laughs> yeah. And, and, and chief among them, his own knives, his own, uh, his own reblades and his own heat treats, you know, he's, he's very critical of himself too. So that's the kind of person that, uh, a new maker, especially, um, you know, before you get your own capability of uh, heat treating that stuff, he's yeah. the guy you probably want to send it to. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, that's long-term goal. Well, I will definitely have a heat treating oven shortly after we get to Utah. That is definitely in the plans. Uh, I lost my train of thought just now, but, uh, yeah. So I don't claim to know everything. I'm I'm definitely still learning at this point. I'm just trying to refine everything as much as possible. Uh, I'm getting pretty comfortable now with um, hollow grinding. Is that, for whatever reason, hollow grind is what what works for me. I don't know why. I just kind of figured that out a lot faster than flat grinding. I definitely need to learn how to flat grind a little bit better because I'm not as good at it as hollow grind, but. Um, uh, it's all still a learning process for me, really, um, trying now that I'm kind of getting comfortable with the squall shape, I've made a bunch of little ones. I've made a couple big ones now, um, starting to play with some new shapes. Um, I made a Tonto. This is actually just to, oh, yeah. um, essentially practice using a removable hardware that kind of has the exact same handle as the other one that I did. Um, I, this obviously isn't like a typical Tonto grind like you would see on an American style Tonto. This is actually inspired by 
Um, unfortunately, you're only going to know this if you follow custom knife makers, but um, Shark Knife Co., mm. um, Edison, uh, this is inspired. It doesn't look really anything like, because I couldn't come anywhere near what he does, but it's, it's inspired by his uh, Ryu model. And that's just like a shape that I really love a lot. It just has like this really robust tip or whatever. And then this is also a full hollow grind. Man. And um, this is also 52, 100 steel. Um, I'm still kind of figuring this one out. I've done another version of it, like a little uh, tiny little like pocket Tonto oh, that's thing. so cool. That is, <laughs> so, okay, so that that is really cool. That's that's even cooler than the one you just had up. And when you, yeah. <laughs> that is, it's like you, it doesn't look like it would be like all that comfortable, but somehow like just mm -hmm. having like your fingers in the little choils and like it works somehow. Like it's a really good. I've been using this to like cut out strips of uh, sandpaper and stuff like that. It's kind of just been like my bent, like my workbench utility blade, pretty much. When you posted um, when you posted the larger Tonto that you were just holding up before you held that, I, I remember looking at that thinking that is a full height grind and look at that tip. Uh, but but in this smaller one, your little shop knife, it seems like you've taken that um, concept to uh, a, a, a different level. Uh, that's a really cool little knife. Yeah, still still kind of figuring it out, but um, I do like it actually like it, it works better than i expected it to um it was just kind of scrap steel that i had and i just every once in a while when i have some leftover material i'll just kind of freestyle it and just try to try to make something new so kind of just playing around with shapes and i just made like kind of this one not too long ago it's like a like a leaf shaped blade i guess it kind of ended up being somewhat of like a sheep's foot but it, my intention was to have like a leaf shaped blade just something i can just have in your hand and it's a nice little, I guess it would probably make a pretty good skinning knife too. But um, yeah, it looks and like then another one I kind of wanted to make like a like a Barlow ish shaped fixed blade, but it's like a very kind of futuristic one where it's just very angular, it's not like curved or like a spear point. It's kind of like a and so it was very neutral starting out, and then I was like, um. I didn't want to make it easy so that my hand could like slip up on the blade. So I did add a finger choil. So it was not neutral, like your typical Barlow shape. And then I also added like a little thing back here to, so you have a little bit more secureness on your hand. Um, but it's kind of like a weird little, I guess, sort of Tonto, Tonto Barlow. I don't know. <laughs> Tonto um, Barlow. I love it. I, I don't know. <laughs> so um, uh, in, in you recently said, um, that well and you were saying it here too that that uh you you have more difficulty with a flat grind uh, which as a total non-knife maker uh, that was a surprise to me but you mentioned uh getting a 72 uh by a two by 72 grinder um yep. basically by selling off your grail knife uh how did that change your knife what were you using before that and how did the the two by 72 change things so when I made the um, the first knife here, I, I made this one. I made this one right here. These are the first three knives I made. With this one actually works pretty well. Um, it's just not finished very well at all. And I made this one right here. These are all actually flat ground. Um, uh, I was using a it was a two by forty two. Right. Yeah. A two by 42 belt grinder. Uh, it only had one speed and then it had an attached disc grinder, which I actually still have that, but I converted, I still have the disc grinder cause that's actually really useful for making knives. And then I also, I took off the belt portion of it and I made that into a, a buffing wheel and I can also use a wire wheel on that too. So, oh. um, but yeah, changing, getting the two by 72, I made sure to pay extra and get the, variable speed because that is a huge help because like it like to have so much control over the speed and um all the attachments like i have the 10 inch contact wheel and having the small wheel as well um because with this with these like knives right here like i had no way of really like doing these really this is not even a tight curve but like these um choils and stuff like that it's 
I don't have the tools to do it. So, um, and something about being able to control the speed of the belt and um, the way that it's on a stand, it's kind of like down, like sort of almost like waist level. You're able to really, really hold that work piece in there and kind of like you have, you can just kind of brace it more and you can have more control. And it was like night and day almost like from making those three knives to switching over to the two by 72. And it was like, it just way more easy. <laughs> like I, I don't even know how to explain it. So, well, actually uh, maybe you can answer this. I've done uh, some rudimentary knives of my own on a two by 42 craftsman. I, it sounds similar to the machine you're, you were describing and yeah, it's got one speed, which is light speed. And, um, you know, you can, you can really heat stuff up and, and grind way more than you intend away. Yeah. Um, but when you slow things down, that gives you, I would imagine more control, but does that also help with, for instance, not ruining the heat treat when you get it back like magna cut or something like uh, that? Going slow. Yeah. It definitely helps with heat management. Um, although I, I definitely, I don't have like a, like a water system going into the belt, but I like, I pretty much just do a few passes on the blade and I just keep dunking it into the bucket. Just, I, I just want to make sure that it stays cool. So, um, but yeah, controlling the speed, whenever I'm doing my final grinds, I'll usually have the belt going a little bit slower. Um, but when I'm doing like the, the, the rough grind, I'll just crank it all the way up and just grind this hog out material. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, really weird to say because I, I didn't just like wake up the next day and all of a sudden I know how to, gr how to grind a knife. Um, again, I, I still make mistakes all the time. It's, it's definitely a learning process. So, um, and these knives that I'm currently working on right now, those are going to be flat ground and I'll probably mess up a few of those too. So, <laughs> I mean, so what, all, where, all, where right? does, where does it take you? Like, um, uh, is it, is it, is it an artistic high that you get? Is it like, is it like building a house with your dad or, or is it more of a, you know, what, what does it bring you creatively? The process? Um, well, at this point, I'm not really doing it for a living. Like I have a job already. So I'm definitely a, I guess what they would consider to be a hobbyist knife maker. And because I am into custom knives and stuff like that, I like weird shapes. I like weird stuff. I'm not making folders, so I can't do weird mechanisms. So I do have the freedom to just, cause I, th these aren't like my, this isn't what I'm trying to live off of. So I kind of have a little bit more leeway. I can kind of just do whatever I want to do at this point. So, um, at, I would like to maybe in six years from now or so, when I get out of the military, it would be awesome if, I got really good at it in those six years and go full-time knife maker. I mean, I'll have that retirement going for me. So that'll be a nice supplemental income and it'd be really cool if I could go full-time, but um, I know there's a lot of knife makers up in Utah. Maybe I can possibly get into one of their workshops and learn from them. Maybe that'd be really cool. Um, see if I can learn some more tips and tricks. Um so you mentioned folders and I know that your collection of knives, at least from what I've seen, uh, from your NAF sergeant channel are folders. Um, yeah, that's primarily the, what I collect. Yeah. <laughs> so is that what you want to be making eventually is, or, you know, is that, is that the end goal or is that just another thing that you would like to be doing? It's something I would like to do if I can figure it out. I would really like to, but right now I'm pretty happy doing fixed blades and it kind of spoils it for me because a lot of times I'll be on like websites and I'll see really cool custom fixed blades. I'm like, that's really cool. And I'm like, I can try to make something similar to that. Like, why do I have to buy that? knife? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so it kind of ruins fixed blades for me, but I do see a lot of really cool stuff online though. Um, but um yeah, definitely. I, I do tend to prefer folding knives a little bit more. Just, I, I do fidget with my knives quite a lot. So, I mean, um, yeah, it'd be really awesome if I could learn how to do folding knives. Be end goal for sure. Uh, if I, 
uh, the plan is to get a mill. Um, long-term goals. I would really, I would like to learn some sort of CAD so I can possibly, um, for at least for the basic knives that I make, like the basic steel, I could have somebody just kind of water jet out blanks for me. So I don't have to waste a whole bunch of abrasives, like cutting out blanks for me. And then I can do those for my regular knives. And then for the, like the more custom ones I can do all myself, but um, it's just basically just kind of speed up the process a little bit more. Um, I just got a laser in, uh, Ooh. last week. I still got to finish setting that thing up. Um, I got it primarily to etch things, but that actually does have the capability of cutting handle material. So I could cut out scales oh. for it, uh, with it, I should say. Um, it can't cut metal, unfortunately. That would have been really awesome, but. Um, so yeah, it, that is my goal basically is just keep learning. And if, if that's where it takes me to learn how to do folders, that would be awesome. Um, if like one of my favorite knife makers wants to take me into his shop and I can be his, his uh, apprentice or something like that, that'd be really cool. But, um, like I said, right now I'm kind of just a hobby knife maker. So I'm kind of just enjoying doing what I'm doing right now. How Enjoying cool is it that, that you just bought a machine that can cut, you know, you bought a laser that can cut handle material. That to me is so cool. I mean, I know I, I show my age frequently, even, even, um, FaceTime on iPhone still blows me away, you know? Uh, but to me, a laser that you can set up to, to not only, you know, engrave your knives and, and etch or engrave your knives, but that can also cut out material is pretty cool. Yeah. This this whole uh you know Keenus and Knives won uh, best Mac at the Texas mm -hmm. Blade Show uh, machine assisted custom knife. I didn't know what Mac stood for, uh you know un until a week ago, and I thought uh, to me that is such a cool um, category because it's totally modern. Like there there are certain parts of the knife making process, like you mentioned, cutting out. Uh, having having blanks water jetted it it's just a, a it's a material money and time saving um uh step but it's also if you want repeatability and you want total accuracy yeah. or at least from the start it's it's a great way to go about it and and it's interesting to see that there are uh that that someone who uses water jets to cut out blanks and then does everything else by hand could be a machine assisted custom knife or basically any any level of involvement with machines and you think about the old masters uh, you know of fine arts rembrandt if rembrandt had access to a video camera or a camera chances are he would have used that tool to to reach his end which is you know right. the accurate representation so um this machine assisted custom knife thing what I, I don't know. I don't know what just made me think of that, but I think it's a very interesting concept and that's what you're doing in a way. Uh, yeah. I mean, that is ultimately what I would like to do is to make things more repeatable because, um, for all my knives that I currently have made right now, all those squalls, like you can put all of them next to each other and not one of them will be identical because all of them are ground out by hand by myself. So, um, <laughs> Like yeah. they have the same shape. They're pretty much all the same length, but there's always something just a little bit different about them. And I know there's a lot of people that actually prefer that they prefer the handmade aspect mm -hmm. of it, but um, I do, I would just hate to sell it to somebody and then have them not like it because maybe that's not what they're wanting. Maybe they were wanting something that was a bit more precise or something like that. Or um, exactly like the one they picked up at your table at Blade right. Show or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's what a lot of like the custom makers do, though. They a lot of they'll do like the, the groundwork, like they'll make. They'll get all of the like the mechanics of the folding knife just absolutely perfect. And then they'll go in and hand finish all the stuff just to kind of give it that that handmade feel. And I, that's like, like my favorite maker, Kurt American. That's oh. kind of what he does. That, that's what a lot of the really high, high end custom makers do. So, um, 
yeah, I, w- I would love to get to that point, but I'm still learning right now. Uh, so yeah, but I'm not uh, going to yeah. try to get any sort of big head right now, but I'm, um, I'm looking, I'm looking at your work as, uh, as Jim scrolls through it and it, you know, I know that you can see as the maker, all the little differences, um, and, and that's all well and good. But from, from this perspective, it, it seems like you've got an incredible amount of control, um, because they all look very, very, um, you know, there may be some little differences, but they all look very much the same model. And, uh, but, but those little tiny variations, like you said, those, those are what make, you know, until, until things are absolutely repeatable, that's what, that's what makes them collectible and charming and, and, you know, will draw people in as well as, you know, your past in reviewing knives, um, because people already know you and already like you. And I would imagine are already rooting for you. Uh, what kind of reception have you got from knife community people that you know um or that follow you um a lot of people are very encouraging um i've gotten a little bit of feedback so far from the knives that i have sold off uh some of them like them i did actually get one back from kevin left edc i mean he would be the one to send it back so uh basically i just had to make a new sheath for him because it wasn't quite doing what he was wanting it to. So I uh, made him a new one and sent it back. So, oh, so it's uh, the sheath. He'll be happy with that. I sent it back to him last night or yesterday. So, <laughs> so he sent it in for the sheath, not for the knife. Uh, well, there was one little part where I did miss on the edge when I sharpened it. So I did resharpen it for him and redid the sheath. Um, because a lot of the sheaths that I did, they were a little bit tight brand new and because i'm like when it comes down to sheaths for fixed blades i am i hate it when i can just take a knife and just shake it out of the kydex sheath like i I want it to be in there yeah so the ones that i did some of them they're a little bit hard to draw out of the sheath but um hopefully they should wear in a little bit but um that's another thing i have to get a little bit better with my sheath making it's not rocket science but yeah there's definitely some some uh things to learn about it there's some uh, there's some feel to it i'm i'm a big fixed knife collector and um yeah i i do not like rattle in in them and uh you know it's not an absolute deal breaker but i prefer not to have rattle i like a tight fit and i i have noticed um with depending on the on the mounting hardware i mean i've i've kind of always been an an IWB strap kind of guy like you have on yours and then and then recently um the discrete carry concepts just for how I carry um is is those are great but I have noticed on some sheaths um when you you know you can have a perfect fit on a sheath and then when you put your mounting hardware on for the whatever clip you're using it does mm-hmm. tighten the sheath it will tighten it up uh, right at that pinch point near yeah. n- and that does change things but um the 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 tighter the fit the better as far as i'm concerned because chances are you're going to be drawing it and you putting it back in drawing it putting it ba- back in and that also loosens the sheath and it it actually cuts a little cuts a little track for you, you know, a little bit in there. And, uh, you know, you don't want it to be like literally cutting the Kydex, but right. the more you wear it in and out, the the more it accepts it. Kydex is not the most, um, you know, it doesn't take much to heat up Kydex. It doesn't take much no. to alter Kydex. So uh, I would rather start with a tight fit and, and wear it in. And also just be, just be wary of how tight you tighten your, um, your hardware, not you personally, but you know, someone who buys a knife and thinks it's too tight. Well, you may have tightened the, the Chicago screws on your thing. or like really clamped it down too much. Right. Yeah. Kydex seems like a buzz. I've made Kydex for my, for my knives, uh, that I like to carry on a regular basis. Say I buy them and they come in a pouch sheath or something like that. I'll make Kydex and I have a little janky little press that I made myself and it's a buzzkill to make Kydex sheaths. I got to say. Yeah. I mean, I've kind of gotten the process down. Like I'll usually 
wait until I have a whole bunch of knives made and then I'll kind of just press them all out like all at once and I'll kind of just try to make them kind of like mass produce them, I guess. But um, I'm definitely learning it a little bit better now. I've kind of learned what to do and what not to do. Um, ideally, it was kind of a design choice, but on my knife, because the blade is sharpened all the way to like where the finger twirl is at, like the full length of the edge is sharpened. Um, that's kind of what a lot of the, like this one that has like the kind of little nub on it. Mm. Like that's kind of what really does well for the retention on the Kydex sheath. So unfortunately with this one, I just wanted the full length sharpened. So um, with this style of knife, you are going to have that blade cutting into the Kydex more often than with the other one with a little nub. Um, but I guess it's just a compromise. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so what, I mean, what fix fix blade makers? So you told me Kurt Merkin is, uh, your, um, your favorite, um, Oh yeah. He is knife maker like, folder. But, uh, but fix fix blade, blade makers. Like, yeah. Only makes fixed blades. Yeah. Oh man. That's hard. Um, put me on the spot here. Uh, as far as like just straight fixed blade makers, I would probably say, um, the only, the only one that I like really kind of gone back and like looked at over and over again, um, is, was that like James Will Williams or James Will Williams blade design? Or oh, uh, uh. Is it James Williams? Williams? William Williams? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but huh. I originally went to his site because he has the the one tomahawk, the the bearded tomahawk. The his his production version is the CRKT uh, Skegox or whatever it is. Oh oh um oh man now now I'm on the spot. I know you talk about um and he was uh yes um he's a uh, he's a uh, a Japanese knife. Uh, right. yeah, yeah. not, not Williamson. It's, um, Williams. Uh, he, he's, he was on the show. He's the guy who knows how to kill you in 50 million different ways without, <laughs> with barely moving his hand. He's a legend yeah. and people are yelling at their screen right now trying to, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Those beautiful upswept blades. And, uh, but yeah, he, uh, I originally went on his website because, uh, he did a batch of his I don't know if they're custom or mid tech, but those bearded tomahawks. Cause I, yes. I love the look of that. It's just like a Viking tomahawk. And I went on to his, into his knife section and I saw it was like a, it was like a Tonto, like a three and a half inch blade. I want to yep. say it was kind of like a, like a, like a Quaken style blade. Yeah. I he's had, he's cool. had Winkler knives making these designs for him and they're, they're gorgeous. And William, uh, this is killing me now uh, I because I get emails from him regularly from his uh, martial arts school, River of Life. I think it's his martial arts school. And I don't know how I got on that. I think just in communicating with him to bring him on the show, James Williams, I think. Uh, all right. I'm going to stop right there because now I'm now I'm just. But but yeah, I, I really love his and you and you know his designs when you see them. He did yeah. the. Uh, the Otanashi no Ken. He's done a lot of stuff for CRKT and they're all those Japanese style Tontos and they're beautiful. James Williams is his name. Geez, sorry for the senior moment there. Um, but okay. So I want to ask you uh, everyone who is a collector who comes on this show and who runs a, or ran a channel, but you still kind of run a channel, but it's more, it's more of an update at this point on your collection, but also on your progress as yeah, a knife if maker. I'm feeling motivated, I'll put a video out, but <laughs> All right, if so I unbox something, if I get something cool in, I'll make a video about it. Like, uh, I actually haven't even made a video about it yet, but I did actually get in the tactile Maverick Ooh, titanium, yeah. um, which unfortunately mine does have a couple problems. I'm still talking to tactile about it, but I do love the design. I think, um, um, Wow, I am blanking real hard on it. Richard but... Rogers? Yeah, Richard Rogers. He did a real nice job on the design. I like how it's really slim, yeah. nice and contoured. I love the texturing on it. Um, nice thin blade stock. I like it a lot. Um, so yeah, whenever I get something in that's really cool, I'll make a video. But 
Um, it's definitely a little hit or miss, I guess. But Well, you still yeah. qualify for the speed round. So I'm going to ask you 15 or 16 questions. Okay. And, and, and it's just a one word answer. And uh, it's, re it, it really, um, you know, kind of shows us all the cut of your jib knife wise. Um, all right. Are you ready? Sure. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. Fixed or folder folder flipper or thumb stud uh, thumb stud washers or bearings bearings tip up or tip down tip up tonto or bowie tonto flat ground or hollow ground um hollow full size or small full gentlemen's or tactical tactical i guess <laughs> you have to choose okay automatic or bally song Ooh, bally song oh do you have one right there it looks like oh, you yeah. reached well, i got for a couple one. now I've, well this is my Ooh, utility oh, blade <laughs> that one sounds cool oh that's that up <laughs> yeah like i just kind of got i got i impulse buy a lot of stupid stuff and this thing is actually Really well made. It's a titanium balisong with a utility blade on it. It looks like it's got a and screwdriver when it's Michael closed. Ziba one as well. So oh, sweet. Um, yeah, okay. I've just been playing around with those, being stupid. But uh, I actually don't. I've had a lot of autos, but I don't really get it very many autos. Sorry, I I, I slowed down your speed round. No, so. no, no, no. That's quite <laughs> all right. That's 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 part of the deal. That that uh, that Bally song, um uh looked like it also had a screwdriver when it's yeah, it has like a little multi-tool type thing on it but sweet all right <laughs> uh benchmade or spider co spider co <laughs> uh chris reeve or rick hinderer chris reeve milled titanium or spring clip <sighs> spring clip oh interesting i like the functionality of it yeah, yeah, I hear that. Carbon fiber or micarta? Carbon fiber. Finger choil or no choil? Finger choil, but not every knife needs a choil. <laughs> I hear that. Also, form or function? Uh, function. I like the pretty stuff, but it has to be a functional tool first. And then lastly, this is your desert island knife. You get one knife to keep forever. Oh, man. The Koenig Arius. <laughs> man, I still need one of those. And you just got that really cool 80s carbon fiber scale. Yep. That. Yeah, this is like such a good knife. Like it is a great fidget toy, but as far as like a functional tool, it is awesome. That so. to me has basically a full height hollow grind because it's all oh, it has yeah, that little much. extra rib up on top for opening. That's a beautiful knife. And and uh I didn't know um, you know, until I knew until I picked one up at Blade Show. I don't have one but flipped it and, and obviously it, it had also been flipped a million times before. So it was a thousand percent broken in and already like amazing before that. So yeah, I, I could see that being a worthy desert Island knife. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you for coming on the knife junkie podcast and, and talking about this uh, move you've made into knife making. I think it's really cool to watch happen and uh i i loved your channel but this is i don't this is better to me because you're obviously a knife enthusiast who's 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 making knives and to me you know i know about making stuff it's not really knives but uh the satisfaction you get from that so it's great to see uh your evolution yep thanks for having me on um hope i didn't bore anyone too bad so oh, thanks dude. for sticking it out and making it this far if you did uh yeah <laughs> thanks to my wife for putting up with me spending long oh, yeah. nights in the garage and she's the one that actually bought the laser for me so thanks to her for that too she's a keeper um, <laughs> yep 
I, I was just kind of browsing. I was like window shopping online. And then she kind of came up behind me and she's like, let's buy that. And I was like, okay. <laughs> that's so. man, that's what it takes. A little bit of support and it keep you going like that. Um, but yeah. So. <laughs> well, thank you, man. We'll talk to you soon. We'll see you on Thursday Night Knives. All right. Have a good one. See ya. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Donnelly of Luck Knives. Um, I like I like saying that better than Naf Sergeant. Naf Sergeant is cool, but Luck Knives is cooler. I look forward to getting my hands on a squall. Uh, that big one is absolutely gorgeous with the with the um, with the flourishes and the and the dime, uh, time ask, not time ask, is dumb ask is handle and blade. But those little those little ones just look like little honeys. So I hope to get my hands on one soon. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another interview. And of course, Wednesday, the midweek supplemental and Thursday, Thursday night knives, 10 PM Eastern standard time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. All right. We will check you out next time for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, then don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast